The scripture this morning is from the second letter to the church in Corinth, chapter 9, beginning with verse 6. Hear the word of God. Remember this. Whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, and whoever sows generously will also reap generously. Each one should give what they have decided in their heart to give, not reluctantly or under compulsion. For God loves a cheerful giver. And God is able to make all grace abound to you, so that in all things, at all times, having all that you need, you will abound in every good work. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Good morning. Will you pray with me? Dear Lord, just help me to get through this and help the words that I speak today be meaningful and that they will, I just pray that they will touch someone's heart. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Amen. This past week, as Lisa said, I had the pleasure of leading the group for story time at VBS. And the stories that we shared from the Bible showed various aspects of being neighborly, from welcoming visitors and being friendly to being bold in the face of possible adversity. We also talked about being giving and forgiving. After each day's vignette, we asked the kids what they could do to be the good neighbor in the story. And their ideas included going over to join someone who was sitting alone at school, or saying hi and being friendly to the new kid in your class, or sharing a snack with somebody who didn't have one, or not pushing in line. According to the kids, being friendly also meant being kind and not hurting someone's feelings. And if you do, then you should say you're sorry and ask them to forgive you. And you should forgive someone who tells you that they're sorry for what they did to you. We also talked about being helpers, and not just any kind of helpers, but bold helpers, like the Good Samaritan in the story. He helped someone who was not part of his group. And he could even be in danger himself, but he helped him anyways. How can the kids do this at school? They said, by not joining in when someone is being teased or bullied, by standing up to the bully, getting help, or just being a friend to the person who is being bullied. And we talked about the term comfort zone as being a place or a situation where you just feel very comfortable. And so, but sometimes in situations we're not comfortable and how can you be welcoming and friendly or giving and forgiving if you're uncomfortable? How can we be bold if you're uncomfortable? One thing I loved about talking with these kids is that they get it. When I asked one group, what happens to your comfort zone when you do something outside of it? Something that you know is right and good, but it makes you feel uncomfortable, but you go ahead and you do it anyway. And the answer they came up with was, your comfort zone gets bigger. Yes. They get it. (laughs) In addition to being welcoming, friendly, forgiving, and bold, we talked about good neighbors being giving. And I came up with four levels of giving that I'd like to share with you. Now, these are not scientifically based. I just made them up. (laughs) Number one is what I call unwilling giving. For instance, fine, just take it and leave me alone. It's not really giving, is it? Level two would be called comfortable giving, or giving away something that you don't need anymore or you've outgrown. Lots of kids have done this, and they feel good about it, and they should. It's better to give these things to someone who can use them than to throw them in the trash where they can't be reused, but it doesn't really take away anything from you. So it's a pretty comfortable way to give. Level three, I called semi-unselfish giving, for lack of a better word. It's semi-unselfish. It's like giving some of what you have plenty of. For instance, here I have a whole package of Skittles, and I'm going to give you five. (laughs) Even though I really wanted them all. 
And then level four is what I call godly giving. It's giving the best of what you have or the last of what you have, not because you don't need it, but because someone else needs it more. This is a really hard one, but it's the one that was told in the story of Elijah and the widow, the widow who used the last of her oil and flour to bake bread for Elijah, even though she knew then she would have none to feed herself or her son. But she did it, trusting that God would provide for her needs. Now, some of you parents out there may worry that I have convinced your children to give away their new school shoes or start inviting strangers into your homes. So now is a really good time maybe to uh, talk with your kids while it's still fresh on their minds about the lessons that we learned in VBS and how you can make those things work in your home. They may have questions like the one that was raised about giving money to someone for food, but what if they use it for alcohol? Does that make it bad to give? And we talked about the fact that sometimes people don't use your gifts appropriately, but that's not your fault. And it doesn't make it wrong for you to give it if you gave it in the right spirit and you had no way of knowing that they wouldn't use it for good. God knows the spirit in which you give a gift. And God knows the spirit of someone who misuses it. And this might be a good topic of conversation. So looking around, though, most of you here did not have a child in VBS this week. But maybe some of these lessons could be a topic in your home as well. For example, what are the limits of your comfort zone when it comes to being friendly and welcoming, being bold as a Christian? Are there opportunities to step a bit outside your own comfort zone? Maybe here at church is a good place to practice. Now let me demonstrate. Step one. Introduce yourself to someone that you don't recognize. If you've actually known that person for 10 years, just claim a senior moment. <laughs> just say it's good to see them. Step two, go beyond that. Hello, my name is and what's yours? Ask them what drew them to this church. What are they hoping to find here? Can you help them meet someone with similar interests? Step three. Sign up for a task or a committee without waiting to be asked. We may not know what you can do or like to do, so tell someone. Do some of these things and you may find the limits of your comfort zone growing just a little bit larger as you become more bold. Now, I wanna talk about the words comfort and comfortable. I looked up the definitions in the dictionary on my phone. I do have a dictionary on my phone, I'm techie now. Comfort, to give strength and hope. Comfortable means feeling at ease. So then I looked them up in the Bible, these same two words. Let's see what the Bible has to say about comfort. In 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 3 and 4, it says, Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of compassion and the God of all comfort, who comforts us in all our troubles so that we can comfort those in any trouble with the comfort we ourselves have received from God. Now let's see what the Bible has to say about being comfortable. Oh yeah, nothing. I think that God calls us to be a little bit uncomfortable as Christians. We need to step out beyond our self-imposed limits to be all that he wants us to be. We are to represent him in this world, and that is not always going to be comfortable. But we are promised that if it causes us pain, God will be there to comfort us. Now, what about being giving? I know it's not stewardship time, except really it's always stewardship time. And this one's for you, Dave. I do want to talk a little bit about giving and how we are called to give not only our money, but also of our time and talent, which sometimes can be even harder. As Lisa read earlier, 2 Corinthians 9, verse 7 says, each person should give 
what he has decided to give, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. Now let's go back to those levels of giving that I came up with. Where are you? Are you level one? Here's five bucks, now leave me alone. Are you a comfortable giver? Sure, I'll be on that task force. I like to do that anyways. Are you a semi-unselfish giver? Yes, I can give one pint of blood. I still have nine more. <laughs> or I can afford to give this am amount without having to give up too much of my own. Or are you a godly giver who says, this is all I have left, but you can have it because your need is greater than mine. And I know that God will provide for what I really need. This is the part that I really want to believe, that God will provide even if I gave everything away. But then that other little voice in my head sometimes says, sure, he can do that, but what if he doesn't? Then what would I do? Honestly, I don't know anyone who is at that level of godly giving when it comes to money, things, or even time. I'm sure some of you are much closer than I am. I'm talking Mother Teresa here. <laughs> I'm still striving for like level 3.2. <laughs> but in fact, I can think of only one example of godly giving in my own experience. And uh, luckily, my son Brian is not here because he'd be really embarrassed of this story. But one Christmas when Brian was in preschool, Bruce and I were talking about sponsoring a family for Christmas. And uh, so we were talking about how much we could afford that comfortable level of giving uh, and what this family needed. And Brian was playing on the floor nearby with his toys, but pretty soon he got up and he walked back into his bedroom and he came out with his piggy bank and he dumped all the coins on the floor and he counted them. And even at three, Brian was always really good with numbers. <laughs> and he looked and he said that he had almost four dollars. And he looked up at us and he said, I can afford to give two dollars. Now this little three-year-old boy was willing to give over half of what he had for an unknown child in need. And we hadn't even realized that he was listening to our conversation. So there's really several lessons that we could learn from that. I've heard it said that a child's heart is closest to God. And Jesus himself said that the kingdom of God belongs to such as these. I've seen the godliness in our children this past week at VBS. I've seen it in their faces as they pray, in their joy as they sing and play and learn. I've seen it in their ideas about how to be good neighbors. In fact, I think maybe we should all go to VBS next year and learn how to be more like our children. Thanks. <laughs>